Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Caravan of Garbage. This week, in celebration of Snake Eyes' Year Zero origin story, we're looking at G.I. Joe origin dukes up. Marriage story, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is also a G.I. Joe origin story of sorts, isn't it, Mason? It's everybody's origin. Everybody's got a haunted past. Everybody's got a flashback. Yep. Everybody's just being a sad Channing Tatum driving a motorcycle in the rain outside a graveyard. It's just, <laughs> it's a lot It's a lot of that. It's, it's a lot of... It's a lot of leaving a like, isn't it? It's a it? lot of leaving a like, and it's a lot of flashbacks and sad origins and... and G.I. Joe sad origins. G.I. G- Joe <laughs> sad origins for a movie that, when you think about it, is ultimately just about toys. Like, I think yeah. that re-watching this movie, I had to... Every, every scene, I had to step back and go, okay, this is a movie, I guess, for children that is just about toys. And if you imagine... All the characters are just action figures and vehicle play sets being wielded by children, smashing them into each other. You go, oh, this is actually that this, makes sense. This actually makes some yeah. sense. Well, yeah, because you, you say it's it's a, it's a toy property, and it is because Hasbro did this off the success of Transformers two years prior. Uh, in the making of, there's literally a moment where one of the Hasbro executives is like, "We looked at all our brands and went, what brands?" And everybody applauded. Well, pretty well, I, I applauded because I'm like, yeah, that's. That's movies, mostly, isn't it? Sure what is. brands do we have? How can we rebrand our brands? And We're lucky this isn't a Cheerios movie, honestly. <laughs> Just Cheerios battling for worldwide supremacy. Count Chocula. <laughs> so, well, that, that movie's Boo def- Berry. <laughs> that movie's definitely coming. Yeah. A lot of this is based off the 1980s rebrand of the series because it was just like a standard action man prior to that. Uh-huh. Uh, and also a lot of the, the stories from the comics. Going into this, were you a fan of G.I. Joe? Because I, I wasn't. Like, I knew bits and pieces, but I didn't really have any of the toys or the ships or the play sets or whatever. I had so many of the toys. <laughs> I read the, the American comics. I read Action Force, the British version. Oh my God. Which is the same thing, but rebranded for, for Britain, and they all have tea and crumpets and et cetera. And it's more wear, polite. They, they wear top hats and monocles and it is more polite, yes. Well, there's a monocle in this. There is, <laughs> well, that's a tip of the hat to G.I. Joe, the action force. Look, I watched this movie in 2009 where I'd spent six months in fairly remote Africa teaching and I hadn't seen a movie. And then on the plane, I sat down and somebody handed me food and I watched this movie and I went... Yeah, I love this. Because it was just <laughs> well, like... And look, I know it's objectively... It's 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 not great. But I think as far as, as you mentioned, the translation from toys to comics, it's it's just a cartoon. Yeah. You know, they have all the sayings like knowing is half the battle, life like hair, kung fu grip, all these mm, things yeah, that huh. come from G.I. Joe. And there's jetpacks and weird planes and big drills and submarines and a night raven. I looked it up, Mason. That's a big thing, isn't it? I mean, I guess it's a big thing. It's a it's it's a very it's a very convenient Mark Six jet that exists. <laughs> There's only one in the world, and it just happened to be there, uh, and it's capable of catching Mark Five missiles. It's very very convenient, and it's also slightly more resistant to nanite technology, yeah, uh, than other vehicles. Well, I think we should take we first of all, it's, it's the rise of Cobra. Everybody out there, it's not rise of the Cobra. <laughs> As everyone seems to think when I have conversations about it in real life. It's not what it's called. It's called The Rise of Cobra. What I did enjoy about this movie is I like the idea of like regular army soldiers kind of encountering this, you know, a worldwide task force that has all this cool tech and all this, you know, all this this slightly advanced warfare stuff. I think that's an interesting idea. I think it takes it way too far and it dips it into sort of cartoony. But I love their greatest weapon, which is, of course, you just mentioned, which is their plot armour, which is (laughs) when every character... Sometimes it's literal (laughs) armour. Sometimes it's literal armour. But sometimes, like in the opening action sequence, you know, Cobra's shock blaster guns will just absolutely turn helicopters and cars just to, to atoms. Yeah. Unless Channing Tatum's in the Humvee, in which case he just flips it over. So yeah, yeah. Just people surviving exploding <laughs> planes and helicopters and things flipping over just because they got, they got to get to that next scene. they got to get to the next scene. So in the not-too-distant future in the year 2020, when this movie is set... Is it? Yes. What? What? Is that... I missed it. This is true. Well, they don't say it, but that that is well, officially... I should have known as a set. big G.I. Joe fan. What's <laughs> happening over in Action Force? <laughs> How are the crumpets in 2020? <laughs> so Stephen Summers, who directed the first two Mummy movies, he took great care, which I also think is a great choice. If you're going to do G.I. Joe, I understand why you'd get someone like him at this time. He took great care to have... Three mummy alumni in this movie. Oh, yeah. Three. 
Do we want to name him? Brandon Fraser's in there. Yes. A sergeant something or other. Yes. Not a character I recognised. <laughs> yep. Kevin J. O'Connor is in this as Dr. Mindbender. Yep, yep. And the great Arnold Vosloo is uh, Zartan. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what I love about Zartan is he's a master of disguise, as we all you know. You mean putting a hat on. As, yeah, I was going to say, putting a hat on, putting on an eye patch. But then suddenly it's like... Oh, we got nanotechnology. We'll just change you into the president. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that jump. There's no, like, prosthetics. There's nothing in between. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but Stephen Summers took great care over the, uh, the technology depicted in this film going through various books and magazines about weapons technology. He feels that almost 100% of the technology can be developed within 10 to 20 years. How do you feel about that? Oh, great question. Mm. Um, By the way, it's a, it's about a, a nanite bomb, and um, the nanite <laughs> they'll, they'll keep nanitizing, and they'll just <laughs> engulf everything. So what's happened is Christopher Eccleston. Yep, he's gotten some juice from Doctor Who. Yeah, and he's on his tour of like doing Hollywood stuff that he hates. Yeah. So <laughs> so he did Thor after this before yeah. this, the same time, the yeah, same he, year, the same sets. Yeah. I don't know. He did that. He did this. He did Destro one of, in this. He did one of those young adult novels. You know, whatever, where he was the guy with long hair. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. they he, all did one of those. He did a bunch of those, yeah. So he's in the middle of this. So he's he is a, he's a weapons designer. Yep. He has developed a nanotechnological bomb that can eat through metal and et cetera and, just, and, ne- and never stops eating through metal. Yes. Never stop, never stopping. But he wants it to seem like they're being stolen so he can... Yeah. Chaos! Chaos, and then he can sell bunkers arms, to the president. But dealing. then he gets somebody to become the president. Yeah. So he's got full control of everything. You could just get him in a toilet. You know what I mean? The you president. Could, is it a social event? Yeah, yeah. He goes into a toilet. I'll suck him into the toilet. I'll suck him into the toilet. Build, instead of build some sort of nanotech <laughs> toilet that you sit on, you think it's a normal yeah. toilet, and then it opens up into like a big well and yeah. it sucks you down the toilet. And then Zartan drops down from the ceiling. Nice. It's perfect. Yeah. That's what they would have done in Mission Impossible, I yeah, feel. Yeah, no, definitely. But yeah, do you think there's too many hologram people in this movie? Because that's a thought that I had. Like, I think a- there's not enough Cisco <laughs> telepresence in this, in this movie. I oh, think there okay. should be more Cisco telepresence than I want to invest in Cisco telepresence. Well, that's very good. Because uh, there were too many scenes where it was like, you better get this done. Oh, I'm a hologram. You better get, you better, you, you're not doing enough G.I. Joe stuff. Oh, I'm a hologram too. It's like, yeah, okay, fine. You're all holograms. Who gives a shit? Stop doing this. It happens like eight times. Well, they did. They stopped doing it and they got to weird jumping around suits. Oh, got yeah. To that. I wanted to ask you about that. So they are called... Accelerator suits. Yes. Now, Stephen Summers, uh, I looked into this because I'm like, is this a G.I. Joe thing? Because I don't remember it being... No. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> so Stephen, this, this this James is my number one beef with this movie as the number one GI Joe <laughs> slash Action Force fan. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I don't, I don't like it. I mean, they again, their action, their action figures clashing together, but it feels very much like they went. You know why Transformers was successful? Yeah. Robots spinning and spinning flipping. through the air in slow motion. We got to get in some of that. Can we yeah. get a human man to do that? He'd be torn to pieces. Put him in a suit. Well, Stephen Summers, uh, he wrote a script prior to this that never got picked up called Accelerator. Oh. And so he went, yeah. <laughs> My dream of making a man slightly faster <laughs> and more bouncy and in bad CGI, it will come true. I didn't mind that sequence because they're jumping through and over buses or whatever. Sure. It's, it's not too bad, you know. And I mean, the suits themselves, when you see like people actually running in them, which they had to do for some of this, uh-huh. it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a great design. Like it's a weird clear face plate. Like I don't, but I just think, you know, there's, there's some fun. It's Can a fun we talk chase. design? Let's talk design. Because some of the design in this, mm. costume specifically, change was, changes were made from the comics that did not need to be made. Are you talking about snake lips? I'm the talking about snake lips? <laughs> with carefully cultivated, <laughs> just moulded, beautiful musculature <laughs> and beautiful lips. You want him to just pick, pick you up in his big arms and cradle you against his big... <laughs> Batman 89 <laughs> carved musculature and give you a big comforting kiss with his big molded lips. Do you think when he puts the mask on he has to lock his lips in? That's a great to the question. the inside of the mask, his I, real lips? I hope so. So that's Ray Park, by the way. People probably figure that out because he's, he's doing all the Ray Park stuff that yeah. you know I love. But sometimes the mouth is slightly open. I'm like, has he got different masks? What's sure. he doing? Because <laughs> the mask doesn't move as far as I know. He has to anticipate when he might be surprised, for example, yeah. or quizzical. <laughs> and then he has to dive behind a pillar and put his quizzical lips on. <laughs> like, hmm, pursed lips to indicate scepticism. <laughs> hmm. uh, so what I think you might be referring to is when uh, Christopher Eccleston's character, who is who is Destro, He's based off his ancestor. He's like, my ancestor wore a metal mask, and then Cobra Commander's like, you'll wear a bloody metal mask all day, mate. And he, so he gives him the nanite metal mask technology. Mm-hmm. Funny stuff. <laughs> just, just a really funny scene, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> just a big egghead with big metal ears sticking out the side. Oh, I'm tremendous. a big fan, yeah. 
Uh, so, but Cobra Commander, I assume you're not a fan of. Oh. Well, first of all, uh, JGL just storming in on Channing Tatum's engagement. What's up? You're getting engaged? Here I am. Right. He's still on, he's still on one knee. Maybe just yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, see how this plays out. And then he becomes Cobra Commander because he goes into a building that's going to be airstrike. Yep. And then he discovers the secret to Nanites. nanotechnology. And then he stays in the building while it gets bombed. But then, because of the trauma mm -hmm. that Channing Tatum felt because he couldn't save JGL, yep. he leaves Sienna Miller's uh, Baroness. Yes. And that makes JGL want revenge against Channing Tatum? Yes. Can't kind of on you, man. Well, I think the costume... <laughs> yes. Is very interesting. <laughs> Isn't it though? Yeah. <laughs> what I also love is he's doing a lot of one eye acting because his mouth is completely covered <laughs> and he's wearing a monocle. So yes. it's just a lot of like intense <laughs> one eye stares. Yeah. You know? And the voice that I assumed he would like it, it's, at a certain point you go, why are you, mm. why did you get Joseph Gordon Levitt if you can't see him? Yeah. And he's doing a voice which I assumed was overdubbed by somebody else, but that's him doing yeah. like the cartoon. Cobra Something Commander like impression, that, yeah. like a like a sort of halfway impression of that. Yeah, its venom can kill a full-grown elephant with a single bite. Crazy Ridiculous. stuff. And then the the mask he gets at the end, rubbish. Well, apparently Awful. it was like, is, does this other mask look a bit like a KKK mask? And oh. I'm like, yeah, I can see that. How anyway, what I'm saying is, based on all this, whoever did the costume designing should absolutely be fired right now from the production of GI Joe: The Rise of Cobra. Wow. Yeah, I'm okay. putting my foot down. Well. Actually, no, you just missed it because this was this was set in the year 2020. Ah, oh, I did miss it. <laughs> Speaking of Cobra Commander, yeah. he's not a guy called Rex. He's a guy named Fred. So, yeah, I looked into it and there's kind of... What is his backstory? He's a guy named Fred. Yeah. And he started a pyramid scheme. Is this true? Some steps are missing. <laughs> and then Cobra. Okay, gotcha. In the town of Springfield, but not the Springfield you're thinking of. A different Springfield. A different town of Springfield. Yep. I like at the end how, because he's not the main bad guy, then at the end he's like... I'm the main bad guy. Call me Cobra Commander. And then they're like, you're under arrest. And he's like, oh, fuck. Because <laughs> if he didn't do that, he could have just said, I was being manipulated. Absolutely, right? But nah, he had to step up, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so there's some Storm Shadow Snake Eye Origin situation, which presumably we're getting in uh, Snake Eye Origins Year Zero. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, where'd he get his snake eyes? Where did he get his snake eyes? Stole them off a snake? Yeah. Okay, good. That is accurate. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So, did Storm Shadow really kill their master when he was, like, eight? Because that's no. crazy. No, spoiler alert. Mm. It was. Hang on, let me think. I am the one you seek. <laughs> Zartan? It was either Zartan or Firefly. <laughs> I can't remember. But it was one of them. It, it, was, was, a, it was a trick. Okay, so they're not really enemies? No. Nope. Oh. Yeah. What do you think of the Storm Shadow outfit, though? That's I pretty good. I love it. He invented the fidget spinner. I was going to say, his dry cleaning <laughs> bills must be insane, but he did invent the fidget spinner. <laughs> so, you know, he's guess, guess he's got that money to burn. Yeah. So is this Do you think there is a real through line there? Because he is fidget spinning that shuriken. I think it's entirely possible. I looked yeah. it up. They were invented in 1993, but they didn't come to prominence until after G.I. Joe Rise of Retaliations. So, you know, mm. what do you do? What do you say? We also got Duke, obviously, who's just like generic action man. I want to talk more about Channing Tatum's involvement because it's it's quite hilarious. I think uh, I know a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. good, good. I mean, this is years before Magical Michael, but he's still <laughs> yes. looking good, isn't he? He's, not looking, yeah. he's not looking like chiseled, but he's looking... He looks great. He's looking great. Uh, and then we've got Ripcord, of course, who uh, his story arc is... I can fly a plane. Mm -hmm. you better no, it'll let me fly no, a let plane. Me fly a plane. Uh, oh, but then they're going to let me fly the best plane. Yeah, that's right. And uh, it's, it's the best voice activated plane. <laughs> the best Celtic voice activated plane. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> so he also. It just keeps getting activated by football chants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so his, his story is also he teaches a very competent uh, G.I. Joe task force member to be less competent and more emotional, mm. essentially. Yeah. So that's fun, isn't it? Sure just it is. wearing somebody down over the course of two hours. I loved how Ripcord and, and Scarlet got their little meat cute. Yeah. You know, they slowly got closer together. They learned to respect one another and, you know, be be, mm. be attracted to one another. And by the second one, they're just going to be obliterated in an airstrike or something. <laughs> or something, yeah. Or maybe off screen. I think it might even be off screen. I cannot, I cannot remember. I have seen it. We will talk about it mm. uh, on another episode of Caravan of Garbage. Spoiler alert next week. That's a spoiler. Uh, I've written here, I like their little cartoon base that they live in. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that they're all just wearing different camo. Like oh, some, yeah. have, some have got urban camo, some have got jungle camo. Yep. Why not? Who cares? I like just it. mix it up, wear whatever you want. <laughs> well, that's G.I. Joe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, James, I have a list here. Yep. It says things that are CGI in this movie that probably shouldn't be CGI in this movie. Here we go. Cars. 
motorcycles, jet fighters, men in robot suits, men abseiling, missiles, smoke, electricity, elevators, glass, sand, snow, water, submarines, large, <laughs> submarines, miniature, fighter jets, underwater military bases, underground military bases, yep. polar bears. <laughs> that is that is the list. Do some of these practical, do some of them as models. Yeah. Just get some stock footage of a polar bear, I yeah. think. Yeah, what you're talking about, I think, is mostly encapsulated in one elevator ride. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific stuff. Um, let's talk, Mason. Okay. In terms Finally, of... Finally, let's get real here. In terms of... I'm turning my chair around. In terms of little little trivia little trivia boys, let's call this. Let's call this little trivia boys. <laughs> Here's a little trivia boy for you. Yep. Uh, hey, Breaker, it's just an ATM, not an ATM machine. Good point. It's not an automatic teller machine machine. Is he the one with the big minigun? No, he's the guy with the, the little goggles. He's on oh, yeah. goggles. It's me, goggles. I'm French. Let's just do it here. There's a minigun in this. What do you think? Uh, pretty good. But it's not tearing through a bunch of people, right? It's not right? tearing through a bunch of people, so yeah, zero. <laughs> zero out of ten. So, um, interesting that you mentioned that uh, Arnold Vosloo is not mm-hmm. the only hangover from the Mummy movies. So, Brendan Fraser, I looked it up, he plays Sergeant Stone. There we go. Popular parade character, presumably. Um, he rolls in on a three-wheeled motorbike. Hell yeah. Just just being like, who's being a G.I. Joe in here? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to check this out. Can I make anybody here a better G.I. Joe? <laughs> Maybe one of these guys can teach me to be a better G.I. Joe. So, uh, Brendan Fraser, and I think Stephen Summers has also mentioned this in, in passing, that in their continuity, he is a descendant of Rick O'Connell. Whoa. So there you go. The Mummy universe, including the Tom Cruise one, I guess, is set in this movie, which means the Tom Cruise Mummy movie is a prequel to this movie. Hell yeah, it is. Fuck yeah, I love continuity. Uh, Maybe he's friends with Serpentor. <laughs> he might be. Yeah. Why isn't there a big snake-faced guy in this? Saving it for the sequels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did they, though? Or the origin, Serpentor origin. Oh, my God. He's a bunch of dictator DNA. They put it in a centrifuge and spun it around. Okay. That's the origin. And some snake stuff, though, right? Not, all, not as much snake stuff. Then why does think. he look like a snake More man? More Hitler stuff than snake stuff. Oh, okay. Terrific. Uh, a post credit scene was planned in which the famously mute Snake Lips tells a joke to the G.I. Joe team, though this was advised against because it would detract from the seriousness of the film as well as go against the... the toy co- film. <laughs> That's right, as well as go against the core of the Snake Eyes character who has always been portrayed as a complete mute. But also, he got revenge. So does that mean he can talk again? Or is this a version of Snake Eyes where his vocal cords are cut or whatever? I can't remember. Uh, I well, think a lot of these questions will be answered <laughs> in, the, in the next movie. In, in, in G- Snake Eyes G.O.J. Origins. Yeah. Well, I mean, this version apparently took a vow of silence. Yes. But the comic book version uh, took the vow of silence specifically that it is like burning jet fuel to the face. Ah, melted, yeah. Melted his head shut. Yeah. His whole head. <laughs> his whole like, head. All the holes in his head shut. So his head just looks like a knee. Yeah. Just yeah. smooth. Yeah, yeah, Baby yeah. smooth. That's right. So uh, Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans nearly got the role of Duke Ooh. before it went. And by went, I mean was forced upon Channing Tatum. <laughs> Contractually, right? Yes. Yeah. So so he signed a three-picture deal early on in his, uh, in his career. Mm-hmm. This was before Magic Mike. So it, w- it was kind of a bit of... What's this Channing Tatum fella gonna do? You know what I mean? Yeah, right. He's, is he a funny guy or is he action guy? So, well, surprise, he's both. <laughs> and he's a dancer. Triple threat. And he's a dad. Oh, he does it all. Quadruple threat. That's right. So and he's got a gun. <laughs> so, uh, there's a clip that we could put in here that Ben will put in, uh, who edits these wonderfully, where he's talking on Howard Stern about how he hated it. <laughs> Look, I'll be, I'll be honest. I fucking hate that movie. You do? <laughs> <laughs> but by the end, also, he was like, yeah, it was all right. He got to work with uh, Jogo Lev. They're exactly. friends, they're mates. They've exactly. been in a bunch of movies together. Uh, speaking of hating it, Christopher Eccleston, uh, you mentioned Here we that, go. that tour of hate, revealed in an interview that he hated the film. What? Yes. Unbelievable. <laughs> and a uh, quick shout out to Norton Security for the download. <laughs> with the nano, yeah, yeah, he has yeah, to get nice. all the nano yeah, technology yeah. onto a, a USB. Mm. Good stuff. Uh, Want to talk budget? Go on. This is a segment of the show called Budget Boys. We're a couple of boys. Oh, we're the Budget Boys? We're the bu- uh, yes. Okay, great. No, I, I mean, love being the Budget Boys. We're definitely uh, closer to like retirement than being boys. <laughs> but <laughs> that's okay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was made for $175 million. That seems like a lot. Yeah. Well, they had to make all those cartoon worlds. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but it only made $300 million at the box office, which means it maybe just kind of broke even yeah, potentially. Yeah, yeah. But it was enough for a follow-up prequel uh, for, with more, even more origins that you aren't even going to believe. In fact, probably, potentially, the best origin of all, the origin of the Bruce Willis that only works a day for a million dollars. <laughs> That's right, yeah. We'll see, won't we? Oh, my God. That's the thing that I learned quite recently. Yeah. And it's given me a whole new perspective on any role he's ever taken. So yeah. I want to go back and re-watch the, the sequel and see if 
That's what he's doing over see there. where it's at. Yeah. So yeah, if you do want to see that video early though, G.I. Joe, um, I don't know what it's... Ret retaliation. Retaliation. <laughs> yeah. That'll actually go up early at bigsandwich.co, won't it, Mason? Yes, they will. always go up. It's a little bit early because Ben gets them done. And if you do sign up there, we've got bonus podcasts, we've got movie commentaries, our podcast, The Weekly Planet, where we talk movies and comics and TV shows. That comes out a day early. We're probably going to do a that Snake Eyes movie, will not we? Well, oh, yeah. We'll have to talk about Snake Eyes, won't we? Yeah. Uh, anyways, I'm at Mr. Sunday Movies on Twitter. I'm at Wikipedia Brown on Twitter. Leave something below if you want us to look at it. We'll look at it, won't we? Yeah. Do you think they should have done a post-credits where G.I. Joe calls an airstrike in on the Black Eyed Peas for Boom Boom Pal? <laughs> <laughs> think that should have been the end? I think it should have Maybe, been. Maybe, yeah. yeah. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, grab that, Jeremy, guys. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Call me.